That is, I am Eric Lawrence, as he said. Uh, I've been attending Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, for uh, almost 27 years now. Um, I am married to a beautiful woman. We've been together for 25 years. We've got six kids. So I do have sort of a background to speak regarding some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, uh, as he mentioned, um, I do belong to a men's ministry entitled The Rangers of Christ, The Rock. And the Rangers of Christ is a men's organization designed to build Christian men into committed followers of Christ and strong godly leaders. Um, uh, we come together just trying to help men be all they can be. So I love that. It doesn't have to take place within the context of the rock. It can take place here. It can take place anywhere. Uh, but we've been doing our thing for 17 years. And even prior to that, um, I held men's studies. God's always put it on my heart that uh, as the leadership goes, so does the rest of the organization or entity go. And that uh, men need to be strengthened, need to be equipped in order to play the role that they play. So that's my heart. Uh, to do that, and so that's part of what we're going to try to do here, uh, or attempt to do here this morning. Um, so, um, just real quick, um, well, there's 12 attributes of a, of a that, or basically uh, tools, that I believe we as men, if we have, it will enable us or help us to do this journey better. And that's wisdom, courage, strength, Purity, integrity, humility, patience, kindness, gentleness, diligence, self-discipline, and self-control. Um, so, uh, the teaching we're going to talk about this morning is the disciplines of the twelve disciplines of a godly man. And many of those that I just mentioned are part of those disciplines because I believe that we discipline, we can discipline ourselves to get better and do anything it is that we choose to do. We may not be necessarily be the greatest, but we can become better. And just real quick, there's the, um, the ministry that I'm a part of was birthed um, out of my time as a police officer. I became involved in law enforcement 31 years ago, just over 31 years ago, I became a police officer. And I retired officially from law enforcement eight years ago, after almost 24 years. Um, and then I became, like he said, I'm over at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, in the security department. So many of you may have seen me over there. Uh, so even though I've been going to Calvary for 27 years, I've been employed there for the last eight years. But here's what was born out of that. As a police officer, what I found was that you could bring a group of guys and gals in, and you could train them to have motivation no, I'm to not do either. basically whatever it is you needed them to do. So I'm looking at that, and I'm saying, well, wait a minute. If that works for the police department, if that works for the military, then that can work for God's army. And that is, if you get people who are motivated, in other words, they've got a reason they want to do it, and they will commit to and discipline themselves to doing certain things, they can significantly improve to the point where they're able to do whatever it is that you're calling them to do. And so I said, okay, got it. Um, and that's part of what we're doing here this morning. And so we're going to go over the 12 disciplines. I'm going to tell you what they are real quick. And then I'm going to go over what discipline is. And I'm going to tell you, so many of you guys out there, I'm sure you guys are athletes. Uh, but we'll get there in a second. And that is, and we're going to have to move quickly because I know you guys want to see the finest hour. But uh, there's three categories for these disciplines. And this comes based upon a book by a gentleman named R. Kent Hughes, Solid Godly Man. Um, and this book, he actually put out the first publication eight years ago. He's updated over the years. And for my son, I brought the uh, disciplines of a godly young man. Because they can provide that for kids as well, or for younger men as well. But the three categories of discipline are discipline in relationships, discipline of the soul, discipline of the character. And within those, there's four in each one. And it starts off, obviously, in order of priority. Um, but guys, how many people out here have participated in team sports? Let me see your hands. Okay. How many people participated in team sports at a competitive level, like high school and college? Raise your hand. Okay. So, which is what I figured. Most of us. 
How many people have participated in martial arts? Okay. So all of us in here basically have participated in something that's required discipline of us. We've disciplined ourselves to be good at our sport and what have you. The author says something that's very important. I read it and I said, man, it makes a lot of sense. He says, if we've done that for our sport, if we've done that for our passion, if we've done that for our martial arts, how much more should we be able to take those disciplines and discipline ourselves to be godly men? And so this is the premise of what we're here to talk about this morning. The first thing I want to talk about, guys, is something that plagues all of us, and that is the discipline of purity. Purity is something that is one of the greatest struggles of men, whether you're a Christian man or whether you're a non-Christian man, because we know that our culture is filled with so many lures, it's filled with so many temptations, it's filled with so much stuff that's going to try to suck us in, an agenda that's under the control of whom? Satan. The enemy. God has made it very clear in his word that he is the prince of the power of the air, that the enemy is the one who actually right now, temporarily, God has allowed to be leading and controlling this world. Now, genuinely, the world belongs to Jesus. Jesus created all things. However, we know that for a time, God has allowed that God's going to take it back. But right now, during this time in which we live, the enemy's carrying out his agenda. And so we want to make sure that we understand where it is that the enemy's trying to attack. Purity is something, is the first one up. And um, if we look at if we look at the things that are part of our culture, we look at our television, we look at YouTube, we've got Netflix, we've got Cinemax, we've got HBO, we've got Stars, the list goes on at Amazon Prime. All of these things contain elements that attempt them to suck us in. We are going to see more sex, more violence. We are going to see more promiscuity. We're going to see more things of sensuality just in a week than our grandparents experienced in an entire lifetime. God did not create us to intake all of these things. He didn't create us for an environment like that where this would be the constant diet of our minds. But the enemy and his agenda, the enemy is pushing towards that. So the encouragement here is to understand that God's will for us, God's will for you and me, is to be pure. And God's very clear in his word. It says here, there's a professional, there's a professor, and read this, this is what we're talking about, the leaders of our country. We have poor leadership. Because the leaders of our country, we look at these institutions of higher learning like NYU, and you have those people who are shaping the leaders of tomorrow for our world, and shaping our children if we choose to send them to those universities. And these people are saying things like this, Professor, and I actually wrote it down because I wanted, I wanted us to hear this, but it said, he was talking about pornography. He said, pornography can be seen as the unique medium of sensuality and sexuality, a pornotopia, a view of sensual delight in the entire celebration of the body, a concept of easy freedom without consequence, a fantasy of timeless, repet repetitive indulgence. Now, this is said by a gentleman who gets paid a lot of money to educate our children. And this is the orientation they're getting. This is absurd. No matter what name you put on this, Pornotopia, are you serious? <laughs> okay, no matter what name you put on it, it's still the same. It's sin against God. Hmm. And the destruction of the individual is the end. And the enemy is using people like that in order to get to us. Now, fortunately for us as saved people, we understand the agenda. But many people don't. It's up to us to protect our kids. But for right now, my encouragement is understand the lords that are out there. Um, with regard to even leadership in the church, it's a struggle for us men. There was a survey taken. And obviously an anonymous survey of 1,000 Christian leaders. 12%, here's where the survey results came back, and this is a few years ago, but it still makes it point. 12% of pastors admitted to having an extramarital affair. 25% of pastors admitted to doing something that they saw was sexually inappropriate. Now, we were talking about 
Basically, one out of eight pastors has admitted that sometime while he was in ministry, that this man, and we're not talking about before he was a pastor, but while he was in ministry, he committed adultery. Their Christianity today, now this was basically a survey that was actually peddled to a thousand people that are just church doors. And Christianity today is read by typically college educated progressive type people. 23% of Christian men admitted to having an extramarital affair, and 45% admitted to doing something that's sexually inappropriate. The battle is real, the struggle is real, and the enemy is coming for us. So please understand that your purity is something that makes a huge impact on the ministry of the church, and God has called us to be people who are pure. Um, and because of the way we have actually because of the way we have handled it, this is the fallout of this, and this is this is the thing that is so disturbing. It doesn't just affect us now. When we fall, it doesn't just affect us. We have children who are watching. We have a world that's watching. And one of the reasons the church isn't taken seriously, one of the reasons the church is just seen as some religious institution that you go to if you need help, or just to fill yourself internally inside because it doesn't satisfy, because you can't get it necessarily from the university or the sports and so forth. And they really don't take the church as something that is a powerful force in our world, is that those people who are members of the church, and many times leaders of the church, aren't really holding to a biblical standard. So the power that God is looking for his church to have in this world isn't being seen. And it falls squarely on our shoulders first. And the disciplines of a godly man is so important because if you're taking a shower, I don't care where you, I don't care where you are in your mind, I don't care how much you've thought of yourself, well, I'm just a follower, I'm not really a leader, or what have you. I've always said if you're taking a shower, okay, and you look down and there's something there, you're a leader. Okay? People are looking for you. And I hope that's not too crass, but people are looking for you. People are looking. I'm just keeping it real. People, if you're a man, if God has created you, a man, then there's an expectation that to some level we're going to be leading. So if we're going to be leading, it's critical that we lead well. And one of the most important aspects of leadership is modeling and it's leadership by example. So we have to understand where the pitfalls are, and we have to understand the dignity of leadership that God has given us and take hold of that and say, I'm going to make wise choices I'm going to do the tough thing, and I'm going to count on the network and the support of my brothers in order to be able to do that, because there's more at stake than just me. My children are watching, the world is watching, and when you read the book of Revelation, and Jesus goes down the list of the churches, you don't want to be that church where he told you that you've lost your first love, and you don't want to be that church that was a disappointment, because during your watch, you did not fulfill what the Lord was looking for from his church or what the Lord has entrusted us to do, which is an awesome opportunity, and it's an awesome sense of dignity that the God of the universe has selected you, and he's selected me for a very important role. Mm -hmm. But it's impossible for us to effectively do that role if we are not strengthened and equipped. One of the things that I used to love about being um, in law enforcement, because I've always been the type of guy that takes the time to work out, is that every day, they would allow the officers an hour to go to a gym and work out. As long as you stayed in the city, first it was just the gym within the police department, but then they said any exercise, any gym within the city of the, where your jurisdiction was, you're allowed to go work out during that time because they want to ensure that their officers are prepared to do the service that that organization is going to provide to the community. Well, it's no different from the church. From the church, we have been called to provide a service or to provide to the community, and we need to be equipped. We need to be strengthened. We need to be in shape to do that. And we're not talking about physical shape. That's that's important. Paul's very clear when he speaks to Timothy about physical exercise and exercise itself towards godliness. But physical exercises of some value for godliness holds value for all things. So we're talking about being godly so that we can reach other people and we can be an example to our world of what it means to serve the living God and be a member of the body of Christ. And then we'll be a credible person to reach out to people who don't want to listen to us. 
hopefully can say that to a knowledge of truth. But um, sensuality is one of the biggest things we struggle with, again, not just in the church, but as a nation. We need to put guardrails in place to protect ourselves. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, it can happen, as far as the infidelity is concerned, understand this. It can happen to any of us. Now, like I said before, I've been with the same woman 25 years, and thank God, I have never, first of all, I've never, I've never cheated on my wife, but I've never even considered something like that. And the reason being is this. And I told my wife this when we were first married. I don't think she liked it too much. But what I told her was this. I said, 95% of my commitment and fidelity to you has nothing to do with you. I said, it has nothing to do with you. I said, I had this commitment before I met you. I said, I love God. And I am committed to living for God through the good times, through the tough, bad times. I'm committed to living for God. And if you look at the example of Joseph in the Bible, when Potiphar's wife came to him and she said, lie with me. He didn't say, hey, listen. First of all, I commend him for not doing it. But his reason for not doing it wasn't, hey, Potiphar gave me a whole lot of stuff. He's put me in charge. I get to run things. I don't want to mess that up. Or, hey, I don't want Potiphar to cut my head off. What did he say? He didn't do nothing. How can I do such a thing and sin against God? Because he recognized that it was God he served, it was God who put him in that position, and Potiphar was just a vessel or tool that God used. But my point was, if it can happen, I don't think it could never happen to me. If it can happen to, well, look at King David. King David was an example of someone that, hey, he loved God, he slew Goliath, he was running from Saul. God finally put him in power. God, he's the king of Israel. He's running things. He's, he's, he's sending men out to war. He's conquering. And he gets complacent. In his complacency, he's walking around in the spring when kings go to war. Where was David? David didn't go to war. He sent his guys to war. But he didn't go to war. He got a little complacent, walking around on the rooftop. Looks over. Sees Bathsheba. Wow. Now, he didn't say, oh, that's another man's wife. I love God. And no. He stopped and stared. After staring, hey, he sent a servant. Go bring that woman to me. He brings the woman to him, and he does the unthinkable, another man's wife. Afterwards, we all know what happens. That she becomes later, says I'm pregnant. After being pregnant, David says, what do I do? So then what does he do? He tries to get Uriah, her husband, to come back from war, to try to sleep with her, to pretend it's his baby. Uriah was a better man than David. You know the story. Yeah. Uriah can sleep with her. Uh, he went back out to war. King David says, listen, she's going to have a baby. I can't be found out. Uriah can't find out. So then, hey, listen, the message is sent. Hey, put Uriah in front of the battle. Let him get uh, killed in battle. Uriah gets killed. David now attacks Bathsheba, who's a widow. Now takes him to himself. That whole thing goes south. Obviously, the baby dies. King David, hey, listen, that's when he wrote the song against you who owned it. And by some sense, it doesn't seem to in your sight. But look at the progression. My point is, you had a man who loved God, who became complacent, he didn't have things in place, he winds up sinning, he winds up now, a baby dies, a man dies, this woman who now comes into his, becomes a widow, all because of David's sin. I look at David as a heavy hitter. So if it can happen to King David, it can certainly happen to us. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Men, it is God's will that we should be pure. Let's band together and commit to being pure. If one of the most important things from this morning's discussion as far as discipline is concerned, if you only walk away with one thing, I would say your purity, where you're at personally, and that struggle, or in that battle, because I think to some degree, especially if you live in South Florida, we kind of have that battle. Please. That is something that's worthy of discipline ourselves to be pure. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, okay, so, how do you do that? It's very easy to say, hey, be pure. 
But if you haven't been somebody who's been really attacking that, how do you do that? Well, my suggestion is this. Number one, pray. Pray that God will give you a heart and desire for Him to be pure. Number two, like we do in Rock, have accountability. Have a person to whom you hold yourself accountable. Each week, asking questions, similar, it doesn't have to be these, but similar to these. Hey, listen, I say, how was your purity this week? Oh, it was, it was good, so what and so on. Okay, let me ask you another question. Another question. Um, have you looked at pornography or anything inappropriate this week? Another question. Well, listen, have you touched another woman this week on an area that we would say, on an area that a swimsuit would cover? Who was it your wife? Have you, was there self gratification this week? Have a list of questions, and then obviously we want to begin. Have you told me the entire truth about our discussion today? Hold yourself accountable. Studies show that accountability is one of the key factors to success in any endeavor that you're a part of. So if you want to be successful at anything, accountability is critical. It doesn't mean that you're weak. It doesn't mean that you're being baby, if you will. It doesn't mean that you're not a leader. What it means is that you're using one of these tools and principles in order for you to be successful. And then, of course, um, memorization. It's very important to memorize scripture. Memorization of scripture and application when situations come up is going to make you a lot more successful. The prayer, the accountability, memorizing scripture, and then making sure that at prayers like bookends, at the end of all of that, you pray without ceasing and you continue to pray that God will both protect you and God will give you a heart, which is the motivation to love and serve him for your purity. Like I said, one of the most important things we can do. Uh, I just want to read you off a couple of scripture verses that I put down here. That's also going to be the ones that I uh, suggest that you commit to memory, and that is Job. In Job 31, 1, Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. It starts in the heart, so if you don't look lustfully, you fight the battle in the heart. Um, Proverbs 6, 27, can a man scoop fire into his lap, I'm sorry, without his clothes being burned? You don't want to even entertain these things, we don't want to even, as far as the things we watch, the things that we read, and so forth and so on, you can't expect to come close to those things or have those things in your life and then be successful. It's going to wind up burning you to some degree. Uh, and then also, and I love this, and Paul says in Ephesians 5, 3 through 4, but among you, there should not even be a hint of sexual immorality of any kind, or of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Okay, so that includes a lot of joking. I remember when I was back at work, and guys would come around, and they'd start talking and so forth, and you can imagine how a group of cops would be. And uh, this was years ago. Um, and I would say, oh, hold on a second. I'm like, you guys know me, okay? Is this something I can hear or do I need to leave? You can kind of make a joke out of it, especially if you're not ashamed of your faith and people have to know you're a believer at work. But things like that aren't things that are, will necessarily offend people or make people think that you're whatever they want to say, you're prudish or stuck up. But they do make a statement about how you feel about your value system and what you're going to do to protect yourself. So that's just something I did, so that's a suggestion for you. But understanding that your heart's in a place to, to uh, honor God and also to be successful. And I've had people to speak to me later in private about things because of doing things like that, they say to themselves, wow, this guy is pretty, you know, pretty real about his faith. And that will cause them later on sometimes to come to you with questions, to come to you with their problems, because they're looking for answers and their buddies who are saying this type of course jokes aren't providing them. So you never know how it's going to come back. I didn't intend for that to be the case, but you never know how things like that are going to come back and bless you. Okay, so. Um, make sure that you build hedges in your life, especially if you are someone who works with, um, and I say works with women, and you say, of course, all women, but I mean, when I was at the police department for years, there were very few women, uh, mostly male dominated field. Um, but especially if you're in a field with, uh, with women, make sure you build hedges of protection around yourself just so that you don't get tempted to have some type of intimate uh, back and forth with a woman. I can remember having a female commander at the police department 
And what was very popular, and some of the guys who were cops can attest to this, is that you would get people would say, hey, listen, let's, let's go to Einstein to grab a bagel and coffee and come back. Hey, let's, whatever. Um, especially if you have one of those, um, I guess you call it an office job. For a couple of years, I was in a unit whereby I wasn't on road patrol. And so I had a female commander who once said that, hey, let's, um, let's go across and grab a bagel or whatever. So I'm thinking, man, what do I say? So I said, okay. So I got in the car, we drove over, we got the bagel. We came back, and the whole time I'm like, man, I'm not comfortable. Now, it was just across the street. I'm not worried about anything. She's not interested in me. I'm not interested in her. But I have a standard. And I have a practice that that's not something I would do unless I really, really had to. Because um, there was another, another situation where I had no control over that. Because you can imagine, hurricane time, they pair us up, two men, you miss a picture in a car. You don't have control over whether you get put in the car with a man or a woman. So if you get put in the car with a woman, you two cops have to drive around telling people to evacuate. You just got to do what you got to do, okay? But obviously, that wasn't the type of situation. I had more control over that situation. So after we did that, I uh, said, you know what, next time, just, I'm going to speak up. So um, I can't remember if she asked me again, or I came out and told her, I said, listen, Maria. I said, um, you know, we went and got the bagel coffee. I said, I got to apologize. I said, I, should, I shouldn't have done that. Um, my wife and I just kind of had a standard, a little bit of standard that, you know, we don't put ourselves in room with the opposite sex and so forth and so on. Not that anything's wrong, but that's just kind of, just for sake of reasons, what have you. And, you know, she kind of laughed at first, but, um, because I don't think she thought I was serious, but then she realized I was, and I don't know what she thought of it, because she made it look like, oh, okay, I understand. I don't know if she went back and talked about me, but I'm not worried about that. But that's what I did at work. And I would even go as far as to, I based this off of Billy Graham, who said he didn't want to do it for me. I would sit in the break room sometimes, and I'd be eating my lunch, and I'd be watching television, and I'm sitting there, and everything's fine. I said, I will never be in a room alone with a woman. And so, if I was in there and there were other people in there, obviously some are women, some are men, that's fine. But if I'm in there and a woman came in there, it was just the two of us, I mean, it wasn't a small break room, it was rather sizable. Um, she could sit across the room, watch the television, whatever. I would say, hey, you know, it's a beautiful day outside. I'm going to go on the patio. I don't know much out there. And I'd actually get up and go over to the patio and have my lunch. My point is this, and they might, that may seem extreme to some of you, um, but the point is, I put hedges in place for myself so that something like that never happens to me. Because um, I remember sitting under teaching on Pastor Janarino, I don't know how many people remember him, but he had a good point. He said, well, if the reason is that the lady is old or that the lady is overweight or that she's unattractive, you know, at what poundage do you cut that line off? Or how unattractive is she going to be before it's on account? And I go, man, you know what, Jim? She's right, you know? I like that. So those are some of my hedges that I use. But you'll have to figure out what that is for your life. But the, the point is, if you have a heart to do that and to honor God with putting guardrails in your life, God will show you what it is that you want to apply to your life. Um, also, be honest with yourself, reality. Don't over-spiritualize and be like, nah, I've been walking with the Lord for 25 years, and now nah, I read my Bible every day. Nah. No. It can happen to any of us. It can happen to any of us. So, uh, remember the 11th commandment, thou shalt not kid, that, thou shalt not kid thyself. <laughs> I, got a, I had a roommate of mine years ago before I got married. He told me that. I'm like, yeah, that's good. And then also, uh, lastly, just have a divine awareness. Imagine... Whatever you are, wherever you are, whatever you do, imagine if you're standing there and Jesus is standing right beside you. Because he is. But imagine if he was physically standing right there beside you. Or understand the reality of a divine presence. The Holy Spirit, first of all, lives in you. You're a vessel of the Holy Spirit. You take the Holy Spirit with you wherever you go. Are you honoring God in your body and in your spirit according to 1 Corinthians 6? Honor God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Your body is God, your spirit is God. When I was with the police department, you know what they did? They gave me a car, they gave me a rifle, they gave me guns, they gave me vests, they gave me all of those things. And I kept those things for the entire time I was in the police department. And guess what? When I retired, I had to give them all back. Because although they were mine under my management and under my control, 
They did not belong to me. And if I use them improperly, I can either have them removed or fired because they don't belong to me. Same is true with our bodies and our spirits. They don't belong to us. They weren't made by us. They belong to God. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 6, therefore, honor God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So that's a good, that was a good analogy. The Holy Spirit spoke to me with regard to our bodies and our spirits. They don't belong to us. They belong to God. Okay, so uh, just I'm going to try to move this faster. The discipline of, that was the discipline of purity, not the discipline of marriage. We're not going to go into all of it in this length. I'm just trying to hit these top ones. Listen, here's what I will tell you. Your relationship with God, by far, the most important thing you will ever, ever, ever do. The most important decision you will ever, ever make, right? So we're going to put that in the category all by itself. We're going to sit that over here, right? Besides that, how many people in here are married? Okay. Besides your relationship with God, the most important thing you will ever have, the most important decision you will ever make, is that decision of who's going to be laying in bed inside your family. By far, by far, by far. So I pray that we've made it wisely. And as you advise younger men, please advise them to make it wisely. And then help them to understand the approach and how they able to do that. And that is, if you think about the fact that God tells us, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved his church. Okay? That's what he tells us in Ephesians 5. Husbands love their wives just as Christ loved the church. So when you look at it, we are the Christ of the relationship. The wife is the church of the relationship. You are to behave towards your wife the way Christ behaves towards you. Sorry, guys. The bulk of the responsibility is ours. The major burden uh, to be shouldered is ours. And so we are going to go through ups and downs. We're going to go through uh, depression. Or, you know, just... Things that our wives, that women can tend to go through because they're more delicate and sensitive by their nature because that's the way God created them. The same God who created you decided to create them like that. So it's all about him and his decisions. And he doesn't make bad decisions. Okay? So he created them for their purpose to be that way. We need to be sensitive to that. We need to own that. And if we choose to make that decision to marry, then that's the way we have to view it and understand that we're going to have to be there for them to be that sort of workforce. And... There's this, and when we love them, it's with a self-sacrificial love. And the definition of love that I have, we know that 1 Corinthians lays out love and describes exactly what it is. My definition of love, to capitalize that, is love is self-sacrificial giving for the benefit of another without expectation of anything in return because we care. Don't expect it in return. Continue to love her, which means understand the woman you marry and how you give to her and honor her and to help her, okay? So the discipline of marriage is critical. And like Christ died, we have to die. We have to die daily. Most of us will probably never, ever be called to die physically for our wives, but we are called to die to ourselves every day for our wives. How many people in there have had to die to your wife? Die to self for your wife? Every day. Every day, which means that her, even when you're out working, even the things that you do, those things are done with her in mind, out of consideration for how do I take care of this gift God has given me? How do I take care of it in such a way that she actually, not just taken care of, but she grows? Because we are to wash in the water of the world. We've heard that. So that we can present to the Lord is bride. She is part of the bride of Christ. So it's not just presenting a better wife to you, but it's also presenting a better wife, a better individual to the Lord. That's our responsibility to do our part. Now the bulk of the responsibility is the Holy Spirit, but we have a responsibility practically. Are we having Bible study with her? Do we pray with her? Do we ensure that she hears a, a biblical message and goes to church, or even if we do it online? Okay, are we putting her in circles of godliness or are we compromising taking her by the South Beach every Saturday night? I mean, I'm not saying in particular that to do that once or whatever is, is, is totally wrong, but what I'm saying is that that's not the type of environment that's going to be conducive to a godly walk if you're there all the time. Does that make sense? 
So we want to make sure that we protect that marriage in that regard. So just make sure that we understand that we die to self, it's going to include suffering, and that we are to pray for our wives, or otherwise it's sin against God if we do not pray for our wives. And so please keep in mind that Jesus in John 17, Jesus prayed for himself, he prayed for his 12, and he prayed for his future church, which is those of us in this room. Pray for your wife. Pray for your wife. Um, sanctifying love. Again, we talked about that. So the discipline of marriage is critical. Make sure that you're giving, make sure that you're giving attention to your marriage. How you spend, if I could look at your calendar, and I could look at the date, the time frame on your calendar, how you spend your time is a reflection of what you truly believe in and what you value. Just like your checkbook, how you spend your money is a reflection of your value system. Because you're going to spend money on the things that you like and the things that you believe that you want. You're going to spend your time on the same thing. And you're going to spend your energy on the same thing. We're not here to talk about that. You're going to spend your energy on the same thing. So let's be intentional with respect to our marriage and understand that the discipline of marriage is a discipline. It requires that you, it requires that you, uh, that you pay attention to it. And I have some suggestions, six suggestions with regard to six areas of your marriage. Uh, if you want to write these down, that I think you need to, uh, to make a part of a solid, strong marriage. Number one is commitment. Please understand that you entered a covenant when you, when you got married. And in that covenant, you want to be committed through ups and downs and thick and thin. You have to have commitment and understand. We all kind of know that. I'm not talking about knowing it up here. I'm talking about knowing it up here as well as in here. Okay? And you see me looking over twice. My wife is calling me. Um, fidelity, number two. We talked about that. That's, that's key. Nobody in here expects Christ to just bail on you. You know, as well as I know, Christ will never leave you or forsake you. And I'm not here to get into theology, but most of you know your future is secure regardless. If you have made a genuine commitment to receive Jesus, even if you stumble and fall, Christ will never, ever, ever leave you. He will never, ever give up. He will take you to his heavenly kingdom and your future is secure because you're written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the commitment he has to you. Do you have that level of commitment to her? That's our, that's our call, guys. That level of commitment to her. Marriage is no joke. Okay. Fidelity. Okay. Uh, communication. Okay, we know that. And that is daily communication with your wife. What I do, 15 to 20 minutes at least of FaceTime, undivided attention. Weekly staff meetings, anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes when you sit with your wife and you talk about the different issues of the week and different issues and things coming up. Make sure you do that because if you had a buddy, and just like when back in high school when you definitely had fewer responsibilities, you talk to your buddy all the time because you guys had a friendship. That's the type of thing you have to do with your wife, communication. So make sure you write that down. Elevation. Elevation is what? Bringing up. Let's make sure we build our wives up. Tell her she's beautiful. Tell her she did a great job with dinner. Tell her that you missed her. Tell her that you think that she's a great mom. Tell her that she, hey, you knocked it out of the park with the way the house looks. Tell her, and the list goes on, okay? Make sure you find ways, be intentional about elevating her. If you have to put it in your phone and set a timer, set that timer every day where, hey, give her a call. You know, she'll think it's out of the blue. Hey, honey, I'm going to call and say, I miss you, I love you, and I think of the world of you is great with the way you take care of the kids. It's great with the way you take care of the house. Okay, elevate her. She's a human being, and she's your wife, and she's a daughter of the king. Help her mind feel strong and confident. Hmm. Next, deference. Deference means defer to her. Put the attention back on her. Let me tell you something, man. A wife is to be the crown of your head. It's to be the crown. Very beautiful, very delicate, makes you look good, makes you look awesome, okay? She's the crown. Let the focus and attention be on the crown. Everybody knows you're the man. Everybody knows that you're the one who's making sure, typically, that a house is there, that a vehicle's there, and everything necessary to have a home, food, and vehicle is taken and put in place. Nobody's stupid. They know that. We can defer to her. Make her feel great. And also, like I said before, in conversations, 
And this is what I have a hard time with sometimes because sometimes I like to get my point across. Am I alone here? I mean, come on. All right. Thank you. Can you, okay, elaborate, so, can you elaborate a little more on uh, deferring? What do you mean by deferring to her? What I mean by this, whether you're at a party, whether you're in a conversation with her personally, whether it's anytime there's an opportunity to put the attention on her or to give her an opportunity to say what she needs to say, or if it's a situation where both of you want to do something, obviously, hey, let her pick if you can. You know what I'm saying? I mean, sometimes if the choice is a poor choice, it's going to get someone hurt, it's going to be dangerous, it's going to be bad. An investment of money, then you have to come along and educate her. But if that's not the case, and it's something that she wants to go to a certain place, or hey, you know, I don't want to go out there. Can we have like a, a date at home tonight? Hey, you have a date at home tonight. But mm -hmm. defer to her desires, defer to her even in conversation, as far as who's going to talk in the conversation, mm -hmm. and defer to her as far as any attention that comes. That's why men say, hey, that's my better half. That's a deference. You're deferring to her. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, time and romance. Um, there's, a, there's an old story about there's a farmer. He's laying, he and his wife are laying in bed. He's out in the middle of Kansas. Uh, tornado comes through the middle of the night, blows the roof off, sends the bed flying through the air. The woman starts crying and crying and crying. The husband goes, this is no time to be crying. She goes, no, I'm crying tears of joy. This is the first time we've been out in 20 years. <laughs> so the point that they're making is this. Listen. Spend time with your wife. Make sure that there's romance. Maybe many of you are romantic. Write her a note. What I used to do is, and I don't do as much anymore, I need to get back to it, so this is kind of convicting. And that is once a month I need to write her a letter, okay, or I give her a card. And what I'll do is, and I'm maybe because I'm old school, what I do is I, I what I'll do is I'll spray it with cologne, let it dry, then I'll write something in it, pack it up, lick it, whatever, put it somewhere where she's gonna find it. Okay? Do these type of things that are romantic. Bring home a rose and leave it for her, or bring home some flowers every once in a while and give it to her. Again, put it in your calendar, have the alarm go off. Okay? <coughs> you're not going to remember you're busy. Okay? But every few months, just because, um, and I'm going to kind of date myself, there was a very popular uh, song. Well, a lot of you guys here uh, are about my age. It's not everybody, but, um, but there's a very popular song back in high school, back in 1981. Um, this was one of my years in high school, uh, by a man named James Engler. And it was Find 100 Ways. Does anybody remember Find 100 Ways by James Engler? Okay. Now, he opens up the song by saying, compliment what she does. That's old school. <laughs> compliment yeah. what she does. Right. Okay. Send her roses yeah. just because. Anyway, he says, if it's violin she loves, let them play. Dedicate her favorite song and hold her closer all night long. Love her today. Find 100 ways. Okay. So the point was find 100 ways to love this wife of yours. So if you remember the song, if you don't, go look it up on YouTube. 100 Ways by James Ingram. Listen to the words. It's a nice uh, romantic army song. So uh, discipline of fatherhood is next, and that is... If you have children, even if your children are adults, understand that it's very important that we not criticize. It's very important that we be, that we be building the, of our kids. Understand that your children naturally desire you and want you. That's a natural thing that's going to go on to some degree forever. Obviously, when they're younger, it's greater. But your children are all, always going to be, even if they want to deny it, they're always going to be concerned about what you think of them and how they live. Understand that, be sensitive to that. When you come home, don't be irritable. Make sure that you're consistent in not just your discipline, but make sure that you follow through with promises and so forth. Understand that fatherhood is also a discipline. It requires intentionality. Be disciplined in your fatherhood. Be disciplined in your friendship. Okay, the discipline of friendship. We as men don't open up as readily, don't open up as easily, and so forth and so on. We need friends. No man is an island. Understand that. If you don't have friends, start to cultivate them, but be intentional. The Bible says a man who wants friends must himself be friendly. So you're going to get more flies with honey than vinegar. Be somebody who's warm. Be somebody who, I can remember a story of a young kid, this is years ago, 
probably about 1994, when I was over at Calvary Chapel working in youth ministry. And there was this kid who was an annoying kid, and like nobody liked him, whatever. I said, okay, I'm going to fix his wagon. So every time I see his name, is David. Hey, David, hey, what's up, man? How was your week? Oh, blah, blah, blah. It's good to see you. You just like, right? <laughs> they just stare at me, right? So I'd be like, oh, I've been paying any attention. Every, hey, David, good to see you, man. I'll go home. So I would, and I can remember I did that for weeks. One time, I'm, my mind's all square, I'm called, all caught up, and I'm at youth group, and I would always approach him. So I'm standing there, and all of a sudden I see something coming out of the corner of my eye. I turn around, and David's there, and he goes, and he stands right up close to me and looks at me because he's looking now for the interaction and, 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 and the compliments and, the, and the, um, the love, if you will, because I always initiated with him. And now, since he came to depend on that and like that, now he actually comes and seeks me out to get it, okay, since I didn't go seek him out. So I found that very interesting, a story I'll never forget. But the point is, uh, friendship, be intentional about your friendship. And we're going to wrap this up because... Um, we definitely, yeah, we want to get to the movie, but um, have an action plan for all that you do. Um, pray to God that it's going to help you grow into the men who are going to expand their capacity for true friendship. Be friendly, put some work into it, listen, be accepting, and then lastly, have hospitality with regard to your friendships. Invite the people over. Now, I'm just going to basically, um, you get the message as far as the disciplines are concerned, but I'm going to hit the other areas real quick so that we can uh, wrap this up, but make sure you pay give attention to the discipline of prayer, the discipline of worship. Spend time. You don't even need to go out and buy anything. It's on YouTube. It's on uh, Pandora. It's, it's turn uh, punch in different worship songs, if you know, and just sit there and have your own personal time. And if you have a family, get your time, your family around for a time of, hey, listen, we love God, we want to pour our hearts out to God, we want to sing to God with our hearts, because there's a side of you that has nothing to do with just your mind. It's your soul, which is your mind, your emotions, and your will, that wants to come out and connect with God from a heartfelt perspective. So, have some time of worship. Uh, the discipline of integrity. Make sure you understand that integrity is who you are when no one else is around. It's who you are when no one's watching. Integrity requires discipline. The discipline of tongue, the discipline of work, and the discipline of perseverance. With regard to work, make sure you show up early, make sure that you stay until it's time to go home, and make sure you deliver to your boss what you're supposed to deliver, when you're supposed to deliver it. The world is watching your godliness, and they're going to judge you not by understanding Bible verses, because they don't understand that. They're going to judge you by what they can understand, which is if I pay you, Make sure you're here five minutes early, and make sure that you leave, not before it's time, but make sure you leave on time. Um, and obviously the discipline of the tongue. Be careful. I've never gotten into too much trouble by something I didn't say. But I have gotten in trouble by something I did say. So please understand what James talked about the tongue. It can set the world on fire. So please be careful with your words. You're responsible for every word that comes out of your mouth. And perseverance. Understand that this Christian, this Christian life, is not a, um, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, and that we are together. We are in it. We are in the fight with you. I'm in the race with you. I support you. I commend you for being here. Understand that God wants you to finish well, and understand that you pace yourself with the strength and the support network of your brothers. Applying discipline. You can use the same discipline you use for sports, for martial arts, and your passion in order to do these things so that maybe you're not going to win the Man of the Year award, but you will be the Man of the Year in your father's eyes because he will be, he will be well pleased with your efforts and how you made a contribution to the church, if uh, by nothing else than your example. You show an exemplary, godly, pure life, and God will put people in front of you for you to minister to, and for you to be a witness, and for you to share the gospel. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to conclude with that, but I've got, do I have seven hats? Yes, you do. Okay. I have seven hats up here for someone who can remember one of the disciplines. I have a hat for you. Does anybody, can anybody, can you please display our hats? Can anybody give me one of the disciplines of the godly man? Purity. 
Ah, purity. He gets a hat. No, don't yell it out. Raise your hand for the caller. First of all, the gentleman. Marriage. The discipline of marriage. The gentleman over here with the blue and white mask. Perseverance. What? Said don't yell out. Worship. <laughs> discipline of worship. Yes, he gets one. Discipline of the tongue. Discipline of the tongue. The gentleman in the blue shirt gets one. This is a heck out right here. Deference. Deference. No, no. Right up here. The deference. He gets, he gets one. The gentleman with the maroon shirt. Prayer. Discipline of prayer. Very good. He gets one. The gentleman beside him. Discipline of worship. The discipline of worship. Yeah. And then we have Down to two. Down to two. Down to two. The doing pretty good. <clears throat> um, uh, the gentleman right here with black mask. Fatherhood. Fatherhood. And Langorio. Elevation. Elevation, which means? To elevate, uh, to lift her up, to right. compliment her. To what? Compliment her and right. to make her Compliment. Compliment what she does. Hi, but, um, let me just, let me, I'm going to pray for you guys real quick. This is on my heart to pray for you guys. This, this, this. This battle's real. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much, Lord, just for this opportunity to speak with my brothers. Father, we thank you that you have made us your sons. We don't take it for granted, Lord. We are very, very grateful that we're brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ and we're sons of the living God. We pray, Lord, that the words that you spoke here, that I spoke, that uh, you would just resonate these words in the hearts of the men, that they would understand that your desire is that they're purity, your desire is that they would run well, your desire is that they would finish the race and that they would glorify you and that they would live lives that are unimpeded and that are unencumbered by the consequences of bad decisions. That they would make good decisions, Lord, because they want to please you and that they would enjoy the fruit of a life of obedience. So, Lord, protect them, encourage them, build them, and help them to understand that whether they're 25 or whether they're 75, Lord, we're still men who have hearts to press forward to protect to love our women, to teach our children, Lord, and to honor you and be examples. We love you and we praise you. Give us a great uh, rest of our weekend and help us enjoy this awesome movie in front of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.